Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hello, my name is Corrado Piscitelli. I am the technical director of Mad Entertainment, uh, a studio animation studio based in Naples, Italy. This is the uh, making of our third animated feature film, uh, Yaya and Lenny, The Walk in Liberty. And this year, in particular, marks the 10 years anniversary of our using Blender <laughs> for making our movies and our cartoons and our um, feature films. As you can see here, we have uh, many projects that we, and even more. There are some projects that were done in the last two years, but mainly I would like to point your attention to uh, The Art of Happiness, uh, Cinderella the Cat, and Yaya and Lenny, The Walking Liberty. There are our three feature films. They were mainly done with the, the same team, and so it is a natural flow of our image, of our uh, narration, and uh, um, whatever we're trying to um, narrate in this world. What this panel would be about? Well, it would be about some general pipeline stuff, because uh, this was the first movie that I have uh, been in charge of uh, the technical direction. I started with the Art of Happiness, where I was mainly in charge of everything 3D about that movie. That, since it's a 2D movie, you might understand that it's very little. <laughs> then uh, I worked on uh, Gatta Cenerentola, uh, it's Cinderella the Cat, that was uh, um, mainly more massively 3D in its use and more massively Blender <laughs> in its use. And I, was, uh, and, I, and I made most of the grunt work of the 3D stuff. And so I had a particular experience in this because uh, this is even my 10 years I master in using Blender with um, our feeder films. So uh, what happened? It happened that I have um, uh, particularly um, many know-how about how we, do, we did all our movies. So I'm trying to talk to you about some pipeline stuff of how we do it, what is our method, and what can be done better. There is um, something about some rig pipeline stuff, because we use uh, heavily rigify for our feeder films, and uh, we found more ways to streamline and use it. We're, we're talking about working with legacy Blender, uh, plus and cons, because this movie was made in Blender 2.79b, not 2.80, and I'm going on about it in a second and how we upgraded our feature workflow. I would like to show you a trailer. Pensavamo di parlare all'universo, di poter fare la voce grossa, ma la nostra voce è perduta per sempre. Non è nostra l'ultima parola. Ma chi? Siete circondati della musica, dell'arte, della natura incontaminata, della schiena libre. <laughs> Della luce di Oste! E quando la terra trema, non fremiamo di più. E quando la terra parla, noi facciamo silenzio. E perfino gli uccelli nel cielo si tacciano. E adesso che devo andare, signore. Fatti il Lenny! Fatti il Siamo figli di una giungla che ci tiene nel ventre. Nel ventre nasciamo e nel ventre moriamo all'oscuro di tutto, ma sotto un mare lontano di stelle. Thank you. I hope you liked it. <laughs> This is our team. It is um, all the, the group that work on that movie. And I would like to show you a little bit of a, um, a montage about our working in it.
thank you again. This panel is going to be mainly about my personal experience in doing this movie. And since, as I said before, this is the first um, feature film in which I was uh, called in a, in a technical direction position. So I had to plan everything. All things uh, that I didn't have to personally do on our previous feature film, uh, Cinderella the Cat. But I wanted to uh, bring all that method, all that know-how into this one and try to uh, have the best outcome possible. So, our feature films, as you can see from this handy graph that's over there, take generally around two and a half years to make. And you can very broadly um, divide them into three steps. The first step is the creation step, where you make all the concepts and you create all the assets that you need to use in the second step, that is a 3D layout phase, where you put all the stuff in, in, inside the same uh, file, and then you can animate it. And it all comes down on a third step, where you render and composite everything. We use, uh, for our feeder films, heavy um, compositing <laughs> to, to get our, our look, a our distinctive look. Let's look at the first step, the concept and asset creation phase. Here, we uh, had to build basically a whole jungle, <laughs> you might understand that uh, what that means. It means we had to make lots, lots, lots of plants. And many times over, because we started with the, the previous method we used on um, Cinderella the Cat, where we modeled everything using only vertex, uh, vertex paint. Because that was light, that was, it was really lightweight, it was uh, really easy to, to model things that had uh, um, um, a fresh look. But, that proved to be a little, um, a little less uh, graphic for what we were trying to achieve because we needed something more uh, worn out, more uh, destroyed because this movie is set in a post-apocalyptic world where everything is overridden by jungle. And so the civilization is no more. There is only um, scraps. There is only... Um, uh, broken stuff, broken down stuff, there's uh, this mm, rotten thing that you have to look around. But so there is so much life with uh, the jungle, as you can see here again. But still there is mm, pretty heavy machinery going around, seeped and uh, beneath the first layer of, of the ground. So uh, we have even small pockets of civil civilization like here, where people just build houses with scraps and fill them with a, whatever they could find. So we had to uh, change our workflow to texture paint because it was much, much easier to convey what we would uh, do. Then, uh, building all that stuff uh, was mainly the easy part <laughs> because uh, my experience comes to the um, reasoning that you have to build every step knowing and planning ahead for the next step that you have to come around. So, uh, for the second step, 3D layout and animation, I was facing um, a problem that I never faced before. It was that I had to usually do all the work alone in this phase. I um, nearly prepared all the, mm, the 3D layouts for um, uh, Cinderella the Cat, and. I couldn't do it for this movie because if I only did that and it was massive because uh, a whole movie is still 85 minutes, it's more than 50 scenes and more than 300 shots, so we had to uh, split it. And I had to build some tools that could make me faster in doing my part and maybe even try to um, explain my workflow to someone else just to get along. So. Even, for example, our typical layout workflow is pretty simple. You just have to take the set, take the characters, and link them into an empty file. This is pretty easy. Usually, it doesn't require that much of an explanation. But even though that is quite easy, there are some recurrent layout issues. You, you can happen to not have in name correctly your collection when you link it. You, uh, might not um, link your character at the word center, and if you don't 
notice that problem before you start animating, then it is hard to uh, extrapolate the same, the same position if you didn't know. Um, it, probably you won't display correctly all the armatures, you, the rig UI was not running, it was all kinds of these issues that uh, simply I was prepared to, to face because I always did. But uh, every, every one of those means I had to lose time and every time I had to uh, lose time, the movie <laughs> lose time. So I took a simple approach and broke down every single action I had to make to, uh, to go on <laughs> in the movie and decided to create just one button for every task. So if I have to link the characters, I have to have one button that links the characters in the, in the scene and uh, controls if all those issues are already um, uh, looked upon so that I don't have to do it afterwards. This comes with the bonus points that explaining to somebody to just press a button instead of um, the, how they could find the character and then import it in the, in the scene and then all many other small, but um, for me simple, but not for everybody, uh, little tasks was much, much better. And um, I never coded before. I'm not a developer, but still I had to, uh, to learn. I tried to find some, <laughs> some way to understand how I could translate everything into an add-on internal for a studio. And that was surprisingly easy. Not because I am some special genius, because I'm not. <laughs> I assure you I'm not. But because there is so much information online. There is a very big community, thanks Stack Overflow. There is a very nice, nice um, general approach to the Blender community to uh, just f um, uh, share information on how they did something. So what I'm trying to do here is trying to share <laughs> what I found doing all this so that maybe um, everyone can benefit from it. So what I learned from this is that everyone can code because if I did it, everybody can. But not anyone should do it because inside the production you have to pick correctly whoever chooses your, uh, your tasks. So since we uh, talked about the uh, linking phase uh, with the, the, the 3D layout phase, we have to, uh, we can move along and talk about the uh, rigging phase. Um, I would like to uh, quote the director, Alessandro Rack, of this movie, that told me, I want to make a movie with just two characters lost in the jungle and nobody else. It was a nice <laughs> information. Having a whole movie in which you have to just create two rigs, it's quite, uh, it's quite a good news. Then the story evolved, and you might judge for yourself with this little, uh, little montage that I made, if that's what happened. If you can see, you have two characters, but then it happens there's another one, because you cannot have just two characters inside a jungle that inter interact with each other. And then a whole bunch of other people, and there are animals. I didn't think about animals, because inside the jungle, there cannot be just people. <laughs> they have to be. Uh, populated with something. And so our character count goes up. It goes up and up and up. If I remember correctly, in uh, Cinderella the Cat, we had roughly, uh, consuming all the variants, 200 and sh short of 250 characters. Here, I can give you some numbers, but we went way overboard with that. We started with two characters, and obviously the director lied to me. And now we have 12 base main characters, of which we have 43 variants, 90 secondary characters with 46 variants, because there are many per se, and 62 different animals with ex the exact same number of variants. So this, this puts the total to more than 300 rigs. And I was basically alone in rigging because it was only me who's going to take charge of that. So I had to, even in this phase, think again 
and confront myself with the fact that I, I couldn't do everything. So I had to break down the rigging phase. I had to um, get all the people that would, uh, wanted to help me in doing this and try to break down the phases in something that would comprehensible for them so that way they could actually uh, do <laughs> what was useful for me and for the movie. Because let's face it, nobody likes rigging. But anyone can help. <laughs> as long as nothing breaks up. And that, that's the hard part, because everything breaks up when you rig it. I never done a rig that works at, at the first try. So what we tried to do, we tried to simplify this. Uh, we had one body, as I said here, one body to roll them all, but it, it, it is a lie, because there are basically five bodies, because it, it, it's harder to do it. But it sounded more cool with one, so I went with one. We had one body to, um, for every body type. So we had a fat, fat person, a thin person, tall person, short person, a man, women. And that came to um, around to five types, five different types, where the, um, uh, the character uh, modelers could just pick one body and then start to uh, model it without changing the topology. This is the first important thing. I made just the first rig with the, all the vertex weights and all the, 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 the best, as I could do at the time, um, uh, rig that I could make. And by modeling without changing the topology, you can see I picked five random characters. We, uh, two of them are, the, are some of the, of the protagonists, and the other three are um, general. Uh, the, what, the one in the center is, um, is um, is just uh, somebody on the, on the background. And the, the last two ones are some secondary characters. As you can see, they all have the same topology. That meant that I could recycle UVs if I use them for the characters. I could recycle vertex weights for the most part. And um, that was a very simple operation that the 3D modelers could do without having to worry about, uh, uh, about too, uh, too, too much stuff. Then, after modeling without changing topology, we made a first rig with basic metric bone positioning. That means we just uh, moved around the basic metric bones and generated the rig, and that was already kind of ready to, um, to make some 3D layouts. Then, at the last part, uh, we make a second pass where the rig is refined and, uh, and, and closed correctly. This means that we have way less operations overall. It is so easy that anybody can learn how to do it. It is animation ready at more early, in an earlier stage than what we had to, uh, to understand before. And uh, I get to be involved only once. That is the most important <laughs> aspect of this, because every time I get involved in this, the movie gets slower. So, uh, I had to add a little note, a little footnote, that most of the times, because I learned that when, however you plan, you may plan everything you want, but still something might not go the way you planned, but still, it's good. So I'm still trying to make you look at numbers. I know, hate me all you want, but uh, I wanted to point out all the animals we made, because uh, doing animals is, um, a really interesting part, because if you have ever used Rigify, Rigify has some uh, pre-compiled metrics that you can use to build your personal rig. Uh, it has some animal variants, but during the movie, we had to make many, many more. As you can see here, we had quadrupeds that mainly covered by Rigify already, birds that's halfly covered by Rigify, many exapods or more, uh, and this is at all not covered by Rigify, some primates, but it, that's basically humans, and some water creatures. And uh, we have only um, sharks, I think, in Rigify, actually, right now. And that is uh, not the same thing as a cetacean, because if you know, the <laughs> back fin goes a different way. So we made some uh, metrics that are in the process of getting uh, adapted to the new Rigify, because Something changed along the way, as you might have grasped from the 2.79b and 2.80. Rigify changed a lot 
between these versions, and it changed a lot again in 2.9 and now in 3 and 3.3. So I had to, um, we're in the process of um, maybe updating these metrics so that they can be added in the next Rigify um, distro. So I have to talk right now about this. Uh, what happened? Why we used 2.79b while there was 2.80? To have this, I have to give you some time of reference. We started pre-production in July 2018. We had our major workflow definition is, if, if this presentation was the real time, I would be nearly uh, at this time talking to you because we had all our rigs defined, we had all our models, we had all our, uh, all our workflow was predefined. And we start, we'll start animation around February 2020. And Blender 2.8 is out on July 2019. It was almost a year after we started. And that's, uh, that was pretty hard because uh, there was all this magical, fantastical stuff happening in Blender 2.8. I wanted to implement everything. I wanted everything that 2.8 could give me. So I tried to make uh, a little bit of um, screening, I tried to, to, uh, to bring everything I did on the, for, the, for workflow in Blender 2.8, but uh, I'm going about it in a minute on what I learned and what I, what I, see, what I saw. Uh, just for reference, I added this production end because we uh, finished on July 2021. Uh, you might notice we took a bit more than was, uh, was uh, in the 2.5 years uh, time reference I gave you at the start. That's mainly because COVID. Then, so I had this new fantastic 2.8 version and I wanted to use it. It had a new collection system. There was grease pencil more useful than ever. Eevee, I, I, I loved a tool like Eevee. I will, really wanted to use it. There were new constraints, new to review port, updated cycles, overrides, better performance overall. It was all I could ask. So why didn't? <laughs> why didn't I use it? That's because every one of these pros comes with a, uh, with a con. So our scripts heavily relied on display layers instead of that on uh, collections and uh, with great power comes great responsibility and collections are basically display layers on steroids so I could not change my mm, scripts relatively easy. We had already defined our workflow so changing it was not so much in, in, in the box for us. We had to convert all our bundle render materials as much as I loved Eevee uh, it was not compatible with Blender Render Materials that we used for pre-visualization, so I had to change everything. We had to rewrite most scripts because the internal Blender structure changed. I don't know if, you, um, if that is clear how much 2.8 was a complete game changer for the whole uh, structure of Blender. And that means even for people. Um, the, for example, I'm, I'm just giving a, a simple example, the change from right-click select to left-click select was something that I had to um, explain to every um, team member and not everybody is always um, ready to these kind of changes. You go by muscular memory, you go by many um, habits and I know you could switch again to uh, right-click select but uh, it was such a major and important change that I thought it was still better to keep um, Blender default settings. 2.9b, uh, 2.79b was a two years old release with already finished fixed major bugs. This is the most important of the, of the things I had to consider because 2.80 was stable, was fantastic, but uh, we didn't know what bugs it could come with using it, while uh, 2.79b, we used it for, even for Cinderella the Cat, so it was quite known for us what, what to expect. And as for 
overrides proxies seem to be still more stable and I, as I saw in the last version of Blender, I can finally use them. <laughs> but up until 2.93, it wasn't, uh, they weren't that stable. And um, finally, there was no going back option. By going to 2.8, every file we saved in 2.8 was, wasn't going to come back to 2.79 if something didn't work. So it was actually pretty hurtful for me. I had to choose why serve in heaven when I could just rule in hell. And I'm not talking better you Blender 2.79b, you're not hell, you were anything, please. So the importance of an LTS version from a studio perspective, uh, I like to look at this in three uh, kind of uh, perspectives. Uh, looking at it from, a, from the past, you can experiment with new features knowing you're not getting left behind if you're not ready. If you have to change, uh, if you see that a new version doesn't support what you did until now, you can just stay <laughs> in your long-term support version. You can, you can more easily find tools for your LTS version since it's going to be stable for two years. This is for whoever uses external add-ons. Everyone who uh, writes an add-on has to maintain it, and knowing that you can write an add-on and keep it for two years, is, it is actually more easier from a uh, managing stand, standpoint. So for a studio that needs to use those add-ons, it is actually really, really important know that, knowing that you can, um, you can afford to use that add-on and it is supported at least for um, two years for your version of Blender. And you can plan on developing your own tools if you're a studio and you need to develop something you will know that it will be used. For example, I had to uh, develop many tools that are not any more compatible with Blender 2.8, but we're going about it. So, with this third movie, with Blender 2.80 out of the question, we had to um, look at ourselves and think, how can we mm, go on? How can we better our distinctive 2D look? Um, what changed during these years? We started with The Art of Happiness, uh, that is a, a full 2D feature film uh, with 3D elements in it. I, was in, uh, I worked on every 3D element you see in, the, in that movie. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about now. But um, it is mainly 2D characters that is the most important part that you have to, to understand for, for the difference. Uh, those were hand-drawn characters moving in uh, a 2D uh, space, but we used 3D elements here and there. For example, in this image of the little kid, you can see the, the grass on the front and the, uh, the tree on the back are both 3D element, elements, while the kid and the, uh, the sky are not. Uh, in Cinderella the Cat, we had 3D characters layered on 2D paintovers because we tried to keep our uh, post-processing process that we used for the Art of Happiness and brought it in uh, Cinderella the Cat, where we used our 2D characters, like in Disney's uh, vertical camera, and, but we um, used the 3D uh, backgrounds uh, to uh, let the 3D characters interact in a 3D space, and then we rendered those 3D backgrounds and had uh, our background artists paint over them to have a 2D layer to use in the compositor. In Yaya Lenny, uh, The Working Liberty, it is full 3D CGI. We have uh, not made this uh, paint over effect, so everything you see was painted over, but in form of a texture on the, uh, on the background, and then used in uh, post-production to get our mm, distinctive look. I'll make some example here, as you can see. In The Art of Happiness, we have um, uh, even, I'd, I'd like to point, there's even more of a change in uh, uh, our stories, because in The Art of Happiness, the, it is the story of um, Sergio, uh, a taxi driver in Naples, and so the whole movie is basically um, two or three guys inside a taxi. <laughs> Everybody is seated down, uh, you have uh, very, um, um, for the most part, the same, um, the same shots inside this uh, taxi. There was a 3D taxi where we painted over, but the characters are 2D, and aside from the, the background, the moving background that is 3D, and some elements like the, the steering wheel, it's all 2D. 
Then we moved on to Cinderella Luquette, where everything you see here is uh, a 3D model that was exported in layers and then painted over. This is uh, a really big change from the look of the previous film. I think everybody can see it. But uh, the big change for us was that now we had 3D characters. We had to make them interact with real things. We cannot use hand drawn anymore. So they had to be moved inside a 3D space. And um, that was the, the, main, uh, the main use we had for um, our 3D backgrounds. Uh, you can see here all the characters have this uh, rim light on them. That's uh, not 3D generated. It is, um, it is used with a, with a process of compositing that gives it a more of a 2D look. Here in Yarian Lenny, you can see everything is 3D, but with our heavy <laughs> compositing and uh, post-processing, everything still has this uh, 2D look about it. Um, all the rim lights you see here are used with the same technique from uh, Cinderella the Cat, so that we can keep that, um, that same feeling, even though now it's everything on, in 3D. Okay. Just to make you understand, I made this little uh, <laughs> video that makes uh, pretty clear it is just a, a visualization. It's not actually stacked like this. But you can see the, the characters are on two separate layers. And the background is generally divided into even more layers, just so that you can, in post-processing, then layer them one on top of each other and have uh, with using various passes, this final result that you see here. So uh, our way of doing this is uh, like splitting the atom. So you have to take the, uh, the final frame and understand that that final frame is the result of combining many of these layers. This is just another visualization of what you've seen before. But uh, it is important to understand that I had to prepare um, a, a system <laughs> that took into account that we had to export everything separated like this. And it should not uh, hamper the animator's work while we try to make all this system. And uh, we didn't have a fixed amount of characters on screen. We had uh, to create this system having to take into consideration even more than two characters because, as I said before, the director lied to me. There were not just two people in the jungle. So I made this, in the, this system that takes up to six characters. And every single one of these layers, for example, I, I took here the, the background layer, is uh, split up in different render, <coughs> render passes that are then used inside a compositor. So there's a color pass, there's a direct light pass, there's a, the ambient occlusion, this our uh, faked 2D rim light, and a mist pass. Um, there is Basically, all the lighting we had done is just in the direct light pass, as you can see. We use uh, 3D lights just to get the general direction of light so that the uh, compositor could just um, use it as a reference to make uh, their fake 2D lights using the mist pass so that, they, uh, that we use it basically as um, a depth pass. Because uh, we use the um, Z-depth in the previous productions. But the, the problem we have uh, with that is that it is parametric, so it changes the, the start at the, and the last value in, uh, depending on what's on screen. While using the mist pass, we could just decide to have a gradient that goes from the start of the camera to how much far we want it to, uh, to consider. And um, you can see here, uh, I had to be sure that all this system that breaks everything down and combines it all over again uh, can, um, doesn't break during the animation phase because we had to have a previsualization that was um, already near what the director had in mind so that he, could, so that he could give some directions, <laughs> it's the director nonetheless, uh, about the light principally. You can see here in this uh, previous that goes to the final, uh, that all the highlights on the plants uh, are the same, even in the final 
uh, in, the, in the final version of the shot. That's because we had, uh, even in previsualization, this the, the power to to notice that. So I had to build specific tools because, as I said before, I couldn't do this all on my own. I uh, had to do it on Cinderella the Cat, and I, but I was in in a different position. So here I would not be able to do everything alone. So I had to uh, at least try to make myself faster. So I built some tools. I built an old tree updater, uh, and, um, un, uh, uh, a tool to match the lighting between Blender Render that we use for previsualization and cycles that we use to, uh, to export, some black magic, uh, I like to call them like that, some black magic buttons that the uh, somebody else would not uh, understand what did, but did what they needed, <laughs> and some internal render uh, submitter. Those are some tools I had to build so that everybody could um, set up their files. I made um, an example here. Um, in this scene, we have uh, the ability to change the uh, direction of light. This is the previsualization scene. In every file, there were a previsualization scene, uh, a character expert scene, a background expert scene, and two scenes for the masks that we needed to output for the background and for the characters. Because when you uh, transform everything in a 2D layer, you have to uh, mask every character with uh, every interaction it has if it's going to be on top with the background that is on the bottom. So you can see here the animator could already change the, uh, the lighting on the scene. And when that goes to uh, render, you, you could go even in, um, in the character scene and isolate the, the, the lights. Because sometimes uh, when you're in the jungle, <laughs> not every light comes across between the, uh, the trees. So there were many instances where our characters weren't lit enough. So we had to uh, make this system to separate the lights of the characters. We have many shots where the background has uh, one direction of light and the characters have a different one, but obviously compatible with that, otherwise you would have noticed that in a bad way. Um, for example, here uh, you can see someone is uh, sending up lights and, and uh, this is, um, I, I can say I messed up the title of this slide, but it's the same. <laughs> uh, here I'm uh, making you look at how this tool works. For example, I opened this file and it was all broken because you can see there is only the character inside the, <laughs> the an empty void, and it is not actually what you have to output. So I made uh, just the famous one task one button button that updated the file to the latest version of the uh, output nodes and, re and set up again all the background and all the levels as they should be. Then you can uh, go for the export part in the background scene. I'm making you see here that what happens in the node editor, but all this, uh, this add-on was made in the, with the, the first principle that uh, nobody should go to the node um, view. Just because everything, every time you change something in nodes, uh, nobody does, nobody knows what happened. <laughs> it is too hard to go there and try again to understand that. And we had more than 300 shots, so it was unthinkable that you had to do this for every single shot. So with that system on, on the left, you can see I could uh, just switch on or off different levels of the background and so that they would get exported or not. And I could set up if that was going to be uh, using the, the same lights from the characters or not. There is even another uh, little gimmick I made here. Uh, sometimes we had um, scenes where the camera was not moving at all. So if the background is not moving and the characters are acting at the center and they don't, don't, move, don't move that much, it was useless for, useless for us to export all the sequence from the background. So we just exported the first frame and then layered the, the characters on it. So we had this, the, this little button that could just render one frame and, but it memorizes the previous duration in case somebody messes up. 
uh, you can see here, I made the same thing for the characters, but uh, the node view is a little bit more complex because uh, there are, as I said before, six characters. So we <laughs> had to take into account that every one of them had to have their own personal output nodes and they had to be switched on or off. And it had to have uh, a comprehensible um, interface because um, I, I was not going to uh, check if, if a particular angle in the, in the node header was on or off. I needed something that was as easy to look at as this one. So you can see, I just want to export these two characters and I want to uh, set up even the uh, fake rim light. We had three presets to use, as in near the camera, in mid-ground and in the more far from the camera. All these tools uh, that I used were uh, really made for, for production, but uh, as I said before, I really uh, wanted to use 2.8. So it's, uh, even though the movie ended more than one year ago, I, I still think, how could I do it today? How would I do it today? And first of all, I would use collections instead of display layers because those are uh, much more powerful. As I said before, we, uh, they are so powerful that uh, it is, for this particular uh, setup, it is not that good. So I have to uh, start to understand a way to minimize the, the options because there are too many. Then I would use Eevee for previsualization and masks and cycles for rendering. Um, uh, this is pretty big catch because EV for previsualization is much, much more faster than uh, Blender render. So it would have been much better if we could use it. I would make it all asset manager compatible because building a whole jungle was big. They had to make roughly more than uh, 70 different kinds of plants. We had to make uh, tens, uh, tens of, of different assets, and so uh, having a, a nice way of looking at them with a preview and importing them in the scene would have been hu a huge way to speed up our set, uh, set process. I would use geometry nodes instead of particles for vegetation, because every time you saw um, the ground, it, it had some uh, particle, uh, particles for grass and uh, having the, mm, the chance to use geometry nodes in uh, our newest production, I will totally use them now instead of particles. And grease pencil for, pe for special effects. Uh, as I said before, we have a really heavily oriented on compositing production. But uh, grease pencil offers the, the chance to use all this, uh, all this stuff directly inside the shot, and it is huge for us because uh, everything that gets moved on <laughs> during the production line is just something that you have to lose more time over it going on. So all the things you can do uh, before they become a problem are perfect. So thank you for watching. <laughs> I hope it was entertaining. I don't know how much time I have. So I'm going to look at it. It's nearly five minutes. <laughs> so if you have some questions, I'm here. If you don't, so say. Uh, how did you approach to create those green lights? Because you said you created yes. green light, uh, green light Thank you for that question. It is. <laughs> um, as I said before, in the past, we used the ZPass. The, the, the ZDEP pass to, to make it. It is actually a, a pretty crude <laughs> method. You just take the, the Z pass and overlap it with itself and tilt shift it with two or three pixels. And then you just, uh, you have to do more than that, but this is the, the core process. As I said before, here we used the mist pass instead of the Z pass because we had every time to uh, set the start and the end of that uh, uh, Z-depth pass for have, to have an, an effective rim light. And the bonus point is that you don't have to put lights around the scene to have the correct rim light, but you can just 
export it. Uh, we tend to, to export uh, two rim lights, one for uh, always, without even having the, uh, without taking into account the lighting of the scene. We always exported one from one side and one from the other side. And since it is a 2D effect, uh, if the camera was tilted, it was still going to go <laughs> like the, the image. So that's basically the, the gist of it. Okay, if nobody else needs to know anything, uh, done.